There is a question that faces us all. What is the future for the climate of planet Earth? Last year, I made two documentaries in which I tried to find an answer. I saw convincing evidence that the temperature of our atmosphere is indeed rising. When we were here in 1998, this whole lake was completely covered with icebergs. If we look at what glaciers are doing all around the world, they're all in recession pretty well. And, and that gives us a very visual record of what exactly is going on in the world's climate. The cause of this rise in temperature can be found locked inside centuries-old ice. The carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are higher than anything we've seen in the past 600,000 years. It's telling us that human activities are having a strong impact on the climate system. The evidence points to carbon dioxide, a powerful greenhouse gas produced by burning fossil fuels like oil and coal. It's helping to trap energy from the sun and warming our planet. With the sheer volume of data available, and with the vast majority of scientists in agreement, there can be little doubt climate change is a reality. It's now time to ask what is the scale of the climate change we face, and how might it affect us and our children. Tonight, I, together with Kate Humble and Matt Allwright, reveal the latest predictions of how climate change will affect the UK through the 21st century. We travel across Britain to discover how our country and our lives could be altered over the next few years. And we see how, in the decades to come, a change in the climate could threaten our cities and even trigger catastrophes around the world that could have serious consequences for Britain. Since the Industrial Revolution, temperatures across the world have risen. But it's in the last two decades that they have accelerated alarmingly. So what's going to happen next? Predicting the future of our climate is now one of the most important challenges faced by science. The more accurate our picture of how our world will change, the better we can make decisions about what we should do. Well, last year, the BBC, along with a team of scientists, launched what is the world's biggest climate predicting project. British scientists are running the world's most advanced programme for forecasting climate change. Its aim, to use the combined power of thousands of personal computers to produce an accurate model of our future climate. Anyone, young or old, could take part and get meaningful results. The computer models help to reveal how much the world is warming and how weather... Altogether, 56,000 people from around the world contributed. The experiment was masterminded by scientists at Oxford University. To get accurate predictions, they needed to run the programme as many times as possible. What would have taken the world's fastest supercomputers a hundred years has been achieved in just a few months. It was hugely exciting to see the first results come out and to see that uh, they, were, they were looking accurate and uh, very useful scientifically. No one knew what these models would predict until the experiment was carried out. But after thousands of successful runs, there's no doubt that the trend for average temperature is upward. Using these results, we're going to look ahead to three different years this century. The first is 2020, just 13 years away. By then, the prediction is an average temperature rise in the UK of over one degree since the 1970s. A one degree increase might seem quite small, but because weather systems are so complex, 
It could lead to some striking changes in our weather. Here's Jay Wynne from the BBC Weather Centre. Hello. Let's start with a quick look back at a typical summer's day from 2006. And the temperature map behind me shows things warming up quite nicely as the day wears on from the morning on into the afternoon. But when you add on the effects of our experiment, by 2020, a noticeable change in those temperatures. Now, on our typical summer's day through 2020, the highest temperatures are likely to be for those southernmost counties of England, typically 29 or 30 degrees. And that's likely to happen several days in a row. So heat waves certainly on the increase as we look towards 2020. Not only that, but droughts are likely to become a bit more frequent. Here's a temperature map from uh, winter 2006, and the blue colors indicating the lowest temperatures. Again, add on the effects of our experiment, and by 2020, again, a notable rise in those temperatures. In terms of a winter rainfall, it'll be on the increase for most of us, but it looks like the wettest weather through 2020 is likely to be in the north and the west of the United Kingdom. A first glimpse of the future Britain might be facing. It's sobering to learn that whatever course of action you may take to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide, the scientists say there is simply not enough time to reverse the effects of global warming for the year 2020. It's likely that it's in the summer months that the effects of global warming will be most obvious. Kate Humble reports on the sort of weather that Britain might experience in the summer of 2020 and how some people are already preparing for it. We're already seeing the first signs of a warmer climate. Last July was the hottest since records began. But with prolonged high temperatures comes danger, especially for the very young and the elderly. In August 2003, during a 10-day heatwave, 35,000 people across Europe died from the heat. It's predicted that by 2020, heatwaves like this will be 25 times more likely. The impact will be felt most in our cities. That's because of a phenomenon called the urban heat island. What happens is that buildings and man-made surfaces absorb much more heat than green spaces do. That heat is then slowly released, increasing city air temperatures well into the night. As a result, there's no relief from the heat, and the bigger the city, the more noticeable the effect. On the 9th of August 2003, central London recorded nighttime temperatures nine degrees hotter than the surrounding countryside. So is there anything we can do to cope with the anticipated increase in heat? In London, one of the hottest places is the underground. If a train breaks down in a tunnel, then the situation can quite quickly become really dangerous. In July 2001, 4,000 people were trapped for 90 minutes. Temperatures soared to 40 degrees. 17 people were taken to hospital and nearly 600 were treated for heat problems. But trying to cool down the tube is a major challenge. You'd think the obvious answer would be air conditioning, but the problem is that most of the tunnels on the underground network are simply too narrow to fit air conditioning on the outside of the trains. And even if you could, the air conditioning systems would simply throw the heat back out onto the platforms. But now London Underground believes it may have found an answer. Parts of the Victoria Line are so deep underground that they're actually below the water table. It's a tight squeeze. Pumping stations work round the clock to prevent the tunnels from flooding. 
David Waboso, London Underground's head engineer, hopes that this water will help cool down the tube. Victoria's got a particular uh, abundance of brand water. We, we pump out enough to fill two of the big size pools every hour. That's extraordinary. And it feels quite cool down here compared to upstairs. It's quite cold. It's about 11, 12 degrees centigrade. This cold groundwater is pumped up to the station where it cools the air. Oh yeah, I can definitely feel the air is definitely cooler coming out of there. It's early days, but they are already seeing a drop of two degrees Celsius. But the real problem is on the trains themselves. How's that going to help the people on the trains? If we did this all over the station, yeah. eventually the whole station would cool down, the cold air gets into the tunnels and the trains get cooler. A two degree fall in temperature so far is no doubt a help. But is it enough? Cooling the tube in the years ahead is going to be an increasing challenge. But the impact of heat doesn't just stop with London Underground. By 2020, thanks to our hotter summers, we could face major problems across the country on all our transport networks. The first effects of climate change we will face are likely to be nuisance and cost. Rail lines can buckle in the heat, causing delays and chaos to commuters. Our roads can soften like these did last year in Norfolk. One answer would be to resurface using better heat resistant materials. But with nearly 250,000 miles of road, it could take decades. An increase in temperature isn't the only change we'll notice by 2020. According to our model, the summers, especially in the southeast, are predicted to be drier and hotter. And that's likely to mean more drought. In order to prepare for the summer of 2020, one solution for the southeast is to build more reservoirs. Thames Water is proposing the biggest one of its kind in the UK to be built here, just south of Oxford. It has the potential to be a massive 10 square kilometres and capable of holding nearly 150 million cubic metres of water. This would supply Oxfordshire, Swindon and London. The proposed Abingdon Reservoir is still in the consultation stage, but if it goes ahead, it will be the first to be built in the UK for over 25 years. Only 20 or so families would have to move. But that's not much comfort if you're one of them. Can you come and stand here a minute? Good girlie. Now, Helen, if this proposed reservoir goes ahead, where will it be? Well, where we're standing now is more or less in the middle of it, so it's going to be about 40 metres deep here. Um, it goes, the house goes, the stable goes, there'll be a big crater wall running round as far as the eye can see, more or less, here. So it's going to totally destroy this area? All of this goes, it's completely underwater. Wow. Thames Water tell us the reservoir near Abingdon is one of a range of measures to meet demand and the impacts of climate change. So, in just 13 years time, it looks like there's going to be a significant impact from the change in our summer climate. But while in some places summer drought and heat will hit hard, in others, it'll be during winter that the problems are most likely to arise. Matt Allwright now reports on how we might prepare for the growing risk of winter storms. South of Glasgow, three centimetres of rain fell in just an hour. Fort Lightning started fires and brought down electricity lines. As you move away from the south, climate change becomes less about heat and drought and more about sudden downpours, which could pose just as many problems.
Here on the banks of the River Severn is the beautiful town of Bewdley. Very picturesque it is too. But in the autumn of 2000, the heaviest rainfall since records began resulted in extensive flooding to 150 properties all along the riverfront. But for Penny Griffiths, the flooding came as no surprise. We've had water in the house 15 times. The first signs really is water coming through the floor, literally, because you flood from a mixture of the water table rising and what comes out of the river banks. So the first thing we do is try and find out if it's going to be above or below worktop level in the kitchen. <laughs> How bad does it get in here? Well, it started the first time was about eight inches deep and it's gradually come up through three foot, through over the worktop in the kitchen, up to 42 and a half inches right through the house. You know, I have to say, did, is it something you checked before you bought the house? We could see how near we were to the River Severn, so there was always a likelihood that we might flood. But we were fortunate that we could stay in the house. We didn't have to move out, even with water here. We could live upstairs, and I think that must be the worst, if you've got to move your house and kind of leave it unprotected. Over the years, the people of Bewdley have learned to live with the threat from a major river on their doorstep. What's more, this brand new barrier, built at a cost of £11 million, should ensure that if climate change does mean more flooding, then Bewdley, at least, is ready. But it looks likely that in the years ahead, more of us will have to make plans to deal with experiences just like Bewdley's. And it won't only be homes near rivers that are vulnerable. Hundreds of thousands of us live under the threat of a completely different type of flooding and we don't even know it. If you live with a river at the end of your street, then you might expect to get flooded once in a while. But recent statistics show that a quarter of all households that get flooded in the UK are in towns and cities like Glasgow here, where the threat doesn't come from a river. It comes from sewage. Because every time it really chucks it down, our Victorian sewers designed to deal with Victorian sewage and Victorian weather, struggle to cope. Scotland is one of the worst affected areas of the country. One of the most shocking examples of the sewers overflowing took place in Glasgow in 2002. The root cause of the disaster was prolonged heavy rain, something Glasgow has been getting much more of recently. New research reveals that during the 90s, Scotland was almost 75% wetter than in any of the previous three decades. And the bad news for Glasgow is that things are likely to get even worse. Based on our data, it's predicted that by 2020, Scotland will get more prolonged heavy rain, plus more short, sharp downpours during the winter. Jeff Aitkenhead works for Scottish Water. So, Jeff, what has to be done? What we can do is increase the capacity of the sewerage system. We can build new sewers for uh, the 21st century. They'd be very big in many cases, certainly bigger than what we're looking at here. We're talking about things that you could drive a car down. It will take many years in construction and cost hundreds of millions of pounds. But it's not all down to Jeff. There's a way we can help, too, by looking closer to home. The poor old car, eh? It does come in for some stick when it comes to the environment. You see, as well as being one of the causes of climate change, our love of the automobile also magnifies some of its effects, particularly when it comes to our drains. Part of the problem is that up and down the country, our front lawns are being turned into car parks which may not sound all that serious until you realise the scale of the problem. There's one. Made a nice job of that one. That's good too. A recent report has estimated that in London alone over the last few decades, over one million front gardens have been paved over. That's an area of 12 square miles. And it's a process that's been repeated right across the country. Glasgow here included. 
So all that rain which used to be soaked up by our lawns and flower beds is now being channeled directly into the nearest drain. But is anyone aware that this could be a problem? Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. Hiya, my name's Matt. I'm from the BBC. Right. Uh, what's your name? Shazia. Hello, Shazia. Hi. Um, I just couldn't help noticing your drive. Right. It's huge. Yeah, it's a big driver. What made you decide to have it done? Is that interesting? Well, the fact that we've got two or three cars. Before there was, what, there was soil? And a few... There was soil, yeah, there was slabbing. Um, right. Just one driveway. Because we're looking at the effect that people um, paving over their front gardens has had. It's actually put a huge strain on the sewers. Right, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. that I don't so. think people... I didn't no, uh, until not, I started yeah. doing this. Well, if you want, I'm going to go down the hire <laughs> shop and get a pickaxe. <laughs> no. Are you okay with that? No, I can't. Just, just this that. half, just this half, and we'll make a nice flower bed. We'll get Charlie Dimmock in. No, I can't. <laughs> thank you very much for talking right, to okay, Thank you very much. You can't blame people for wanting to pave over their front gardens. It increases the value of your property and cuts down on your car insurance, but it also contributes to flooding. It's a classic climate change dilemma, the sort of thing that we haven't had to think about before. If we do nothing, then your street could be the next one to get flooded. Even by 2020, it's estimated that the number of homes at risk from sewer flooding will have risen by a quarter to 100,000. That's 100,000 households for whom climate change could mean a big shock. While it may be impossible for humans to reverse global warming by 2020, that's not necessarily the case for 2050. Scientists believe that with the right measures in place now, it should be possible to lessen the impact of the climate change that Britain experiences in around 40 years' time. However, as there remains worldwide reluctance to act, in this experiment, the assumption was that our dependence on fossil fuels will continue to steadily rise until 2050. And here, the results show a very significant rise in UK temperatures of around two and a half degrees. This time, we add on the effects of our experiment to push it ahead towards 2050. And you can see a very marked change in that to temperature map. The deep shades of red indicating temperatures of 30 degrees or more. And that's going to be happening across a wide area of England and Wales. Indeed, by August 2050, we are looking at something like half of the days in that month hitting 30 Celsius. A quick look ahead to a winter 2050, and the story really is of uh, less snow and more rain. There will still be some snow over the tops of the mountains, the Cairngorms in particular, but even here you will see the uh, snow line rising quite dramatically, and I suspect by this stage a white Christmas, a thing of the past. Up until now, we've been focusing on how climate change will affect us, the human population of Britain. But what about our natural environment, the landscape and the other species that we share these islands with? This beautiful great crested newt normally comes to ponds like this one in order to breed in the springtime. But it's plainly not spring now. In fact, it's about midwinter. The fact is that this creature, like so many, is getting out of step with its environment. The two and a half degree change that we can expect by 2050 could prove decisive for the survival of a large number of animals and plants native to Britain. And a place likely to see dramatic changes is the Scottish Highlands. Professor Des Thompson works for Scottish Natural Heritage. In mountains we have a number of highly specialised species, birds and plants that are supremely adapted to very cold, wet, windy conditions. And with climate change, these conditions will change and these habitats and species will contract or disappear as a result of that. Yeah. 
One of the species thought to be at risk in Scotland is the ptarmigan, a bird so adapted to its landscape that it actually turns white every winter. But with our model predicting less winter snow for 2050, scientists fear that not only will the ptarmigan's white plumage make it vulnerable to predators, but the plants and insects it feeds on could also disappear. Snow actually protects a lot of plants as a sort of cover, as a duvet, believe it or not, for some very rare mosses and ferns. Now imagine the horror when the snow's gone that much earlier. The food plants they expected to find aren't there, more critically the insects. If the ptarmigan hasn't got these conditions, the ptarmigan can't nest. So when a particular population stops nesting, that population starts to crash. And the ptarmigan isn't the only species facing an uncertain future in Scotland. This is the breathtaking sight of Atlantic salmon battling their way upriver to lay their eggs. On the river Blackwater, Simon McKelvey and his team have been recording their annual migration. We're standing next to a burn here which we've been monitoring for more than 10 years now. And one thing that we've noticed here is that after very sudden flash floods, the salmon population has crashed. The reason for these losses is the sudden downpours of rain that Scotland is beginning to suffer more often. I'm standing on a bank of gravel here which has just recently been deposited. This gravel was washed down within the last week. So you can see how loose and unstable this is. Now, salmon were probably spawning just upstream from here, and this sort of gravel is the kind of habitat the salmon would have been spawning in. So any eggs that were laid in this gravel before it was washed out would have been killed. With our computer model predicting even more heavy downpours for Scotland in years to come, Simon expects things to get significantly tougher for the salmon population. If we were to see these sort of events becoming more frequent by 2050, I wouldn't anticipate that we're looking at extinction events, but we're looking at populations be becoming more uncertain and varying more from year to year. And it's not just the wild animals that will be under pressure from the changing climate. Go on home. Go on home. Going home, guys. Alan Stewart runs a team of sled dogs in the Cairngorms for racing and tourism. And about five or six years ago, we used to get around about two and a bit, three weeks of snow at this level. But now, uh, say in the last, last year, I had about three days of snow at this level. And his dogs are noticing the change too. This is Rowdy, and Rowdy is a three and a half year old Alaskan Husky. Hiya mate, come on out. Here's my boy. Come on and see me. Come on, come on pup. As you can see, Rowdy is molting big time at the moment and this would never happen two years ago. All my Siberians and Alaskans are molting eh, and I've never seen this before over the last 18 years. Things have got so bad that the only way Alan can now keep his dogs cool enough to race is by showering them down before and after every run. Everything stares you in the face when you live in an environment like this. I see a lot of difference going on in the last few years, and it affects my dogs and it affects their way of life. Then you start really talking about it and wondering what's going on. And just as animals are being affected in unexpected ways by the changing climate, so are our plants. In fact, some farmers are already planning for a very different climate in the decades ahead. Mark Diacono has planted Britain's first olive grove on a 17-acre site near Honiton in Devon. I think there's a number of uh, misconceptions about olives. They do need greater heat, they need a longer season of growing for the ripening of the fruit as well, but they do need periods of cold. And I think that over the next 40 years, up to 2050, we will see increasing amounts of warmth, a longer season that are going to suit these very well. And it's not only the olive market that Mark's hoping to crack. 
Well, we're here in the almond orchard. We're here in the middle of the winter. These new leaves are coming out here. It's lost all the early leaves from earlier in the summer and spring. But as you can see, a lot of new growth, not a lot of new leaves. We would have expected all the leaves to be gone by now. They've tripled in height for the most part in 18 months. So that leaves us pretty hopeful for all the new stuff we're planting. We're planting more peaches, more apricots. We're bringing grinding peppers here, a range of spices, lemons and pawpaw and kiwi, all of which can step up and become commercial crops in time. Mark's aim is to be harvesting olives commercially by 2011. But the changing climate in Devon has taken even him by surprise. Already we've seen changes with global warming. We've had handfuls of, of fully blackened, full-size olives already, which we weren't expecting for years to come. The natural world is full of complex relationships between species, many of which we still don't fully understand. And this makes it difficult to predict exactly which species will thrive and which will lose out. But already, even in 2007, we can see how ecosystems are being changed dramatically. And we can be pretty sure of one thing, that if we fail to control our use of fossil fuels, the British countryside of 2050 will be a very different place from what we see around us today. But what might happen even further into the century? Well, our experiment predicts that 2080 will see the average temperature in the UK increase by a huge four degrees. Let's start again with our temperature map of the typical summer's day from 2006. This time we add on the effects of our experiment to push it ahead to 2080. Now we are factoring in that a four degree average rise across the United Kingdom and what a dramatic effect that has. In fact, uh, during August 2080, we could well see 40 Celsius on a number of occasions. Looking ahead to a winter 2080, and it's certainly going to be a lot milder than we're used to at the moment, and with higher sea surface temperatures around the UK, it could well turn a bit more stormy, and that's posed a threat to the low-lying coastal areas of eastern England in particular. With the effects of heat, drought, and disrupted weather patterns intensifying, a four-degree rise would be potentially dangerous for Britain. 2080 may seem a long way off, but it's the world our children and our grandchildren will inherit. So we need to understand what impact a four degree change in temperature might have on our way of life in these islands. Kate Humble reports. Urban planners are already thinking of ways to cope with the consequences of such a rise in temperature across Britain. One area that will have to change will be the design of our homes. By 2080, our homes will have to be able to shut out the summer heat, conserve water and use the minimum amount of energy possible. Well, this could be a model for our future living. Beddington Zero Energy Development, also known as BEDZ, is the UK's largest eco-community. It's an experimental setup offering a practical solution to sustainable living. Well, that's what the blurb says, but what's it like to live here? Sue Riddlestone and her family moved in when it was built four years ago. Wow, it's so light and bright and pretty, isn't it? It's fantastic feeling. Well, when we first moved in, um, we thought, wow, this is really fantastic and futuristic. Um, but actually, after a couple of weeks, we just got used to all the various features. Believe it or not, the house doesn't need any central heating or air conditioning. It's all down to the architecture. We've got these very thick walls, right? a bit like a church where you've got these sort of solid constructions so that it keeps fairly cool in the summer mm -hmm. and also keeps the heat in in the winter. 
The sun floods in through the south-facing conservatories, capturing natural light and heat for the cold winter months. Wow, look at this. I love this sort of futuristic rooftop we've got here. It's fabulous. <laughs> Lining all the roofs are strange-looking vents. They capture the wind to ventilate the homes in the summer. Energy use in our homes accounts for 27% of all carbon emissions in the UK. The aim here is to reduce that down to zero. All the hot water and part of the electricity comes from one central unit on site, fueled by locally sourced wood chippings that would otherwise go to waste. The site has also been designed to save water. The roof is covered with a plant called sedum. Sedum is like a succulent plant. When it rains, it holds the water and stops it all rushing down at once. And then we collect the rainwater in big tanks under the ground and we use that water for flushing the toilets. <laughs> yeah. Bedzed is one of the few housing developments around now that's been designed to suit the climate conditions of the future. But can these ideas be scaled up so that by 2080, whole cities offer sustainable living? To adapt the 22 million homes across the UK would certainly be a major challenge. And how will people get around? Will the car still be the main form of personal transport in 2080? And if so, what will power it? The hybrid car is now a reality. And looking further ahead, hydrogen is being investigated as a potential fuel of the future. Lotus has built a sports car that runs on bioethanol fuel made from plants like sugar beet and cereals. Woohoo! <laughs> but is it more sluggish than the petrol version? Well, the answer is definitely not. It can get from 0 to 60 in just 3.8 seconds compared to 4.1 with a positively snail-like petrol version. All this and its kind to the environment? This fuel is already doing well in other countries and now petrol stations across the UK are starting to supply it too. But this car does produce CO2 emissions just like any other car. So what's the advantage? Well, it's all to do with the fact that biofuel comes from plants. As plants grow, they naturally absorb and store CO2 from the atmosphere, which helps balance out the CO2 that's created when you burn the plants for fuel. could provide one solution for now. It could even be the answer for the aviation world too. But there is a serious drawback. To grow enough plants to make the biofuel that would be required would need an awful lot of land. Finally, what about holidays in 2080? David Viner from the University of East Anglia has studied how climate affects where people choose to go on holiday. We use something called the Tourism Comfort Index, which is a combination of temperature, rainfall, sunshine, and can correspond that with people's desire for a nice beach and a personal sense of well-being as well. So we know at the moment, places like Costa del Sol in Spain have the ideal climate for tourism. As the climate changes, the tourism comfort index will change. It will become increasingly less suitable in the Mediterranean for tourism, whilst at the same time in Northern Europe, places like Blackpool here, will start experiencing the climate like the costas are having in Spain at the moment. But could this really be true? Could Blackpool become top of the league of European resorts? But with all this talk of future tourism, let's not forget the bigger picture. A rise in temperature could well mean a rise in sea levels. 
and that's one of the reasons why Blackpool is spending £64 million on this seawall to protect itself. And by 2080, sea level rise could indeed be a growing problem. As temperatures around the world continue to rise, so our oceans too will get warmer. And as they do so, the seawater will expand. This, combined with melting ice near the poles, could produce a significant rise. Add to that the likelihood of more ferocious storms, and Britain could be at greater risk from a phenomenon called a storm surge. As Matt Allwright reports, until recently these were relatively rare events, but they may become more common in the future. On the night of the 31st of January 1953, a massive swell of water swept down the entire length of the North Sea. Known as a storm surge, a combination of gale force winds, low pressure and a high tide brought havoc to over a thousand miles of British coastline. By dawn the following day, 306 people were dead and 30,000 were facing evacuation. Canvey Island in Essex was one of the hardest hit spots. As a five metre storm surge raced down the River Thames, few of the 13,000 residents here, mostly living in single storey buildings, had any idea what was about to happen. It was really rough. It was taking waves right across the top of the boat. And the first thing we encountered was a, a bush, large bush, with uh, two bodies hooked up in it. All you could smell was this horrible smell that was sort of coming up from everything. And that's something that's always stuck with me, this vile smell which I always associated with uh, death, I suppose, you know. The reason Canvey was unable to resist that night's storm surge was the state of its flood defences. This is one of the last remaining stretches of the original sea wall here at Canvey Island. And you can see when you look at it why it breached in so many places because fundamentally it's a big mound of earth and that's it. But what was a disaster for Canvey Island and its inhabitants was a blessing for the capital. If the sea defences here hadn't breached and in a thousand other places up and down the east coast of the UK then London, without a doubt, would have been engulfed. So, well before climate change was even an issue, plans were put in place to construct a huge flood barrier to protect the capital from the next storm surge. But London has now been made free from the threat of flooding. Some 30 years later, and the Thames barrier was complete. For the last 24 years, the Thames Barrier has protected one and a quarter million Londoners down there from the threat of serious flooding. Not to mention several occasions when the waters were almost up to the same level as the 1953 floods. But by 2080, the Thames Barrier is unlikely to be able to safeguard London from the biggest storm surges. Thanks to more violent storms and rising sea levels. Official figures predict that by 2080, sea levels off the southeast coast of Britain could have risen 75 centimetres. Some scientists think even this is optimistic. Well, as far as future sea level rise is concerned, I think we're in for a, a rude awakening, as it were. We've seen, for example, in Greenland recently that the ice cap is melting at twice the rate it was just a decade ago. Now, there are a number of studies working in this area who suspect that sea levels may rise one to two metres this century. If that happens, we're in real trouble. But exactly what kind of trouble? What sort of damage could a big storm surge do to London? 
If the barrier is overtopped, then the, the surge of water will move very, very quickly down towards central London. River levels will rise dramatically to something like two metres above embankment level. So you're talking in Westminster and the embankment area, the whole central part of London, water that's at least two metres deep. Now, if we go further east, the situation is much worse. In Docklands, in Wapping, in other areas there, you're talking maybe three, four metres of, of flood water or even higher. Given the consequences of a major flood, not to mention the cost of defending against it, you might think that developers would be falling over themselves to avoid building new houses in high-risk areas. But you'd be wrong. We're about three miles down from the Thames Barrier, heading east towards the sea, in an area called Thames Gateway. And as you can see, there are new developments all the way down the riverbank here, and on both sides, in fact. Uh, what's very interesting is that the government has announced another 120,000 homes to be built in this area by the year 2016 on the floodplain. Now, is it me or is that a little bit worrying? The insurance industry should know. After all, it's their job to assess risks just like this. We are very concerned that flood risk hasn't been taken properly into account in developing some of the areas in, in the gateway. We don't want people to find themselves in their dream home and for it all to turn into a nightmare because they simply can't afford the insurance in the future. And if I'm worried, it's nothing compared to how worried the insurers are. The worst case scenario is that costs of flooding could rise from around a billion pounds a year now to perhaps 20-fold to 20 billion pounds a year uh, in 2080 if we do nothing to manage the increasing risks. There is one possible solution, but it's not cheap. A massive 10-kilometre outer barrier spanning the mouth of the Thames estuary and costing an estimated £20 billion, roughly the equivalent of Britain's total annual council tax bill. It's clear the increased threat of coastal flooding is going to cost us all a lot. And there's no argument, of course, we have to protect places like London. But... How much are we prepared to spend to defend the other low-lying areas of the UK? Will future governments continue to fund the construction of sea defences for those much smaller communities at risk from coastal flooding? Well, if the present guidelines are anything to go by, then the answer is no. You see, the decision to give your community funding for flood defences depends upon how much your community is worth. And to put it bluntly, some communities are worth more than others. Which all sounds as if some places could ultimately be left poorly defended. The Environment Agency advises the government on flooding. Well, there's no question that with climate change, um, hard defences will become increasingly costly to build and maintain. There will always be cases where it simply doesn't stack up to continue to provide a high level of hard flood defence for some communities. Anyone who lives in the floodplain is at risk and always has been. We're managing that risk the best way we can. It comes down to simple financial realities. Climate change could mean that in the future, some communities will be left at the mercy of the sea. The likelihood of such severe weather events far in the future will undoubtedly depend on the action we take now to reduce emissions. But suppose little or no action is taken. What could happen to our planet's climate into next century and beyond? Well, predicting the future after 2080 is beyond the scope of our model. But there's growing evidence that catastrophic events might be triggered.
Perhaps the most obvious such danger lies in the great polar ice sheets, which are melting faster than many scientists had anticipated. I mean, what we're talking about, four degrees in places? Yeah, yeah. Professor Peter Cox is one of the world's leading experts at predicting our future climate. Yeah. The snow and ice across the planet currently keeps us cool by reflecting the sunlight. Once the ice sheets start to melt, um, you no longer have the bright snow and ice reflecting the sunlight back to space. So you get more sunlight absorbed, the planet warms even faster, more ice is melted, sea level goes up further. So what we have here is a, is a, is a vicious circle. In this scenario, global warming could accelerate rapidly and sea levels rise disastrously. If ultimately the entire Greenland ice sheet was lost, sea levels would increase by seven meters. So what would that mean for the UK? This is the Fens in East Anglia. It's one of our lowest lying areas. It comprises 4,000 square kilometers of wetlands, which support a rich variety of animals and 48% of England's prime agricultural land. It's also home to some 385,000 people. Unless fortress-like sea defenses are built, with a seven meter rise, almost all of this would be lost. And this isn't the only place in the UK that could disappear. 26 million of us live close to the British coastline, and nearly half of our manufacturing industry is here. All this could be under threat. We know from past evidence of the way the climate's changed that, that trigger points have been crossed in the past. There have been rather abrupt changes in the way the climate has behaved even before humans started to mess about with it. So there's a concern that as we go into the future, we could cross some of these thresholds. And with temperatures soaring, there is a risk of other, more surprising dangers ahead. One is locked in the world's permafrost, the vast frozen peat bogs around the Arctic Circle. If they were to thaw, they would release carbon dioxide and methane, another greenhouse gas, but 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. We can actually see this happening today, closer to home, in the peat bogs of North Wales. Now it's in pools like this that you can get bubbles of methane released. Now the bubbles build up in the peat and when they build up to a certain quantity, then they rise quickly to the surface and they are lost. The release is affected by temperature, so as things warm up, you get both more carbon dioxide produced and more methane produced. There is little to fear from these small-scale emissions, but 5,000 kilometres away, it could be a quite different story. Western Siberia is home to the world's largest frozen peat bog, and now, for the first time in 11,000 years, it's showing signs of melting. This could eventually unleash a massive quantity of greenhouse gas, helping to drive up global temperatures even further. And there may be changes to other ecosystems around the globe. The plants of the Amazon rainforest are a massive store of carbon. But in 2005, we saw what could happen more often if temperatures continue to rise. Part of the Amazon forest dried out and it caught fire. As the forest burned, carbon dioxide was rapidly released into the atmosphere. If the earth continues to heat up, the entire forest could one day disappear triggering a further catastrophic change to the Earth's climate. But however badly our climate is affected, the most serious impact on the UK is likely to come indirectly from those countries that are hit harder. 
We in the UK are very dependent on importing goods and food from other parts of the world. So even if things didn't change detrimentally in the UK, and they probably will, we would be affected by the supply of these things from other parts of the world. Severe disruption to climate and an increase in sea level would make millions homeless in Africa and Asia and create a human tragedy and a threat to world security. There will be tensions in the world created by additional migration because there are climate refugees wandering around looking for suitable landscape at a time when population is likely to be going up. Basically we've got this problem that most impacted people are in the developing world who are A, less able to adapt and B, not responsible for the problem. We are so connected now across the globe that we will be affected by environmental change wherever it occurs. The effects of such big global climate changes in coming centuries are impossible to calculate with certainty, but it's all too easy to envisage how devastating they might be. If the world waits and does nothing, it may well end up in dangerous and unknown territory. So it would seem reckless in the extreme to simply hope such events won't happen. The good news, however, is that it doesn't have to be this way. There is much that each of us can do to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide by using less electricity in the home, for instance. Some businesses are starting to make an impact with more efficient processing and transport. But far more is needed. The world has huge potential for generating electricity by renewable sources that don't need fossil fuels. In the UK, wind power could provide a large part of our needs, something we are just beginning to exploit. But in order to tackle a problem of this scale, a bigger global effort will be needed, and there will no doubt be a cost. According to a recent government report, however, it will be cheaper to act now than wait until later. I'm optimistic, having done this review, that we have the time and knowledge to act, but only if we act internationally, strongly and urgently. It's a massive political challenge, but it seems that the fate of our country and our planet depends on what today's global leaders decide over the next few years. Climate change is surely the biggest single issue that the human race now faces. And today we stand at a unique, pivotal place in history. We now have the facts. The world is becoming more aware of the reality of climate change and it's not yet too late to do something about it. For all of us, it's truly the time to act. For a free open university guide telling you more about climate change and what you can do, and to discover more about OU programmes, call 0870 942 1342 or go to our website where you can also discover more about the results of our unique climate prediction project. <laughs> <laughs>